Hello and welcome to Heroic Media. I'm Michelle Bauman. And I'm Patrick Cordova. Here at Heroic Media, we discuss news headlines that deal with foundational moral issues, issues of family, marriage, and life. Right, and a lot of times our topics will be around abortion, euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, and homosexual marriage. Exactly. So Patrick, what's first up today? All right, first up, after months of debate and strong opposition, the California governor, Jerry Brown, has signed into law a bill that legalizes physician-assisted suicide. So we've been talking about this. Uh, we mentioned it on a previous episode mm -hmm. as well, uh, that this bill was had, had come up. And right. uh, there's been a lot of controversy around it from a lot of different groups even, right? It hasn't just been religious groups, right. but it's been disability uh, rights groups, um, civil rights groups, healthcare groups, a, 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 a wide array mm -hmm. of people have brought their opposition forward to the California governor. And, uh, you know, there was even at one point when the, in, in, in July that the, that the bill was temporarily withdrawn, withdrawn. Mm -hmm. and then it came back on. And then now apparently uh, it's passed and it passed by a vote of 23 to 14. Um, and so obviously, uh, you know, that's it, it, well, not obviously, but it's the fifth state mm -hmm. uh, in the United States to legalize this type of physician assisted suicide. And so there are a number of concerns that we have with this. What, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. You know, I think this is just, it's heartbreaking and it's so sad that people don't realize what the consequences of this are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, very ironically, this was passed, it was signed by the governor who happens to be Catholic. Um, it was signed into law five days after the end of National Suicide Prevention Month. Oh, wow. And so what kind of standard is this setting and what is this telling people? You know, our, our laws really do play a role in forming people and showing people what's right and wrong. And people do. You hear people say, oh, well, it's legal. It's okay. You know, yep. so, so what is this saying? This is saying, well, if you're, you know, now there are restrictions on this. You have to be terminally ill with a within um, six months. expected to die yeah. within six months and medically competent when you make the decision. Right. And so if it's okay to kill yourself under those circumstances, then what about if, you know, you maybe have longer to live, but you just hate your life? Yeah. What about, you know, what is this going to look like from the view of the 15 year old girl who's just, you know, gotten broken up with by her boyfriend and she doesn't think life is worth living anymore? Mm -hmm. And well, you know, it's, I, I just watched grandma kill herself and she was so peaceful about it. And yeah. I think I'm going to do this same thing. There are ripple effects in society from this. Yeah, and I mean, there's all kinds of things, right? What, what kind of loopholes could come in, right? What if there's a doctor uh, that, you know, is known for saying, oh yeah, this person is terminally ill because, you know, I don't, I'm just making something up here, but like say there's a scenario where, you know, he's going to say, well, the terminal illness is that this person's going to commit suicide anyway, so we may as well put them out of their misery now. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that I can think of where this law could be twisted out could of proportion abused. or could mm -hmm. be abused, but I think you're right. The big thing with this law is what it says, because people listen to the laws and say, well, if this is, they look at the laws and say, that's what's okay. And so that's why it's important to have laws that are in line with moral thinking. And so, uh, you know, this law says, hey, if I'm suffering or if I'm in pain or if I'm a pain to others or if I'm going to die, then just kill me now. And so it sends, I think, the wrong message. To Absolutely. And, the biggest thing. and we have statistics backing this up. In Oregon, there has been, since they legalized physician assisted suicide, there has been a 50% increase in overall suicide rates, which means that this is actually happening. It's not just a theoretical. Right. So in California, Sacramento is actually one of the top five cities in the country as far as suicide rates goes. So we're taking a population that's already very prone to suicide, mm -hmm. and then we're giving, we're saying, okay, we're gonna legalize this in some cases. Yep. So it's just so sad that we aren't looking through and that the lawmakers didn't look through the implications of this. Yeah, exactly, and I think that it kind of boils down to this whole like mentality that we have nowadays that says, you know, I want this, it's a right, you can't take it from me, it doesn't affect you. You know, and because it's, it's just, it's me that what I would be, you know, putting it into my life. It doesn't affect you. But I think that that's not true. You know, we already mentioned that these laws set a precedent and kind of uh, a mindset for people in society. Um, but it, it, and that's how it affects more than just them, right? Mm -hmm. it, it affects all of society. And, uh, and so it's not just like some sort of law that's in this little little cube that just applies to right. a person, right? It affects everybody because it affects the mentality of society and how we view life, how we view, uh, view death, pain, and, and hardships, right? Basically, we live in this society where we just want this quick fix or this pill or whatever, you know, something to, to fix our problems, the next new thing, you know, always the best. And you know, we have all these quick little one-line things that we like or that we go for, and this is another thing where, hey, if there's some sort of problem, it's easy, we get rid of it. It's legal. Everything's okay. Right, absolutely. And we, we've seen 
we've seen documented cases of abuse as well where this is legal, where family members or doctors are pressuring people, where it becomes a financial decision, yes. where people with disabilities are discriminated against. Another yeah. really interesting point is that there's a study that was done that mm -hmm. found that the majority of people who request suicide, assisted mm -hmm. suicide, when they're treated for depression, they withdraw that request. So we're killing our depressed people. Yeah. We're killing our depressed population, and that's absolutely awful. Yep. Um, and then just one other point that comes to mind, I know several people who have received a terminal diagnosis uh -huh. years ago who are still alive today. Absolutely. And what happened, is either the, the, the diagnosis can be incorrect, or sometimes the medicine advances, and something that previously had no cure, all of a sudden there's an experimental treatment, and they go in and they become you know part of the test group, and they survive. So yeah. I think it would be absolutely absolutely tragic if those people had gone and killed themselves. It's not the end of the road, you know, it's not in it. There's, there's always things that could happen, but it, and I think from a Christian perspective, you know, we use that suffering isn't always a bad thing. And Christ mm -hmm. taught us that, that we can unite our suffering to him on the cross and make good of it, right? We can turn that into something that, that, that is good. So, Absolutely. I think that's the underlying foundation, you know, apart from all these other things from a Christian yeah. view, that's what life is. And it's something sacred always. Yep, exactly. Yeah, indeed. All right. In our next story, one of the largest Catholic healthcare operations in America is being sued by the ACLU over its refusal to provide abortions. So, another case with the ACLU, right? The American Civil Liberties Union. Um, they're suing uh, Trinity, health, uh, Trinity Health Corporations, which is a very large mm -hmm. uh, a corporation. It's headquartered in, in, in a Detroit suburb, and they have like 80 locations across the United States. Right. So they're very big. And they adhere to um, uh, the, the USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I always have a hard time saying that one. Uh, they, they, they adhere basically to Catholic practices on uh, teaching on morality right. as it applies to health care. So things like uh, you know, uh, abortions, of course, is a big one. And so, of course, at these hospitals, if you go there and you try to get an abortion, they're going to say, no, that's against our principles, our values. We will not provide that health care service here. And so the ACLU says, oh, you can't do that. And so, um, and so they are suing them. So that's the situation yep. that we're in. <laughs> it is, and it's sad. You know, how ridiculous is it to think that, oh, I'm going to go into a Catholic hospital and demand that they do something that's against Catholic teaching. Why would you even think you can do that? Right. So honestly, the mindset here is, is just really unfortunate, and then to have this lawsuit. But the interesting thing is that the ACLU has already filed a similar lawsuit yes. against the U.S. bishops, uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and mm -hmm. that lawsuit was dismissed by a federal court in July. Right. And so now they're like, okay, we're going to try this again mm -hmm. once it was already failed. And so, so this group is seeking a dismissal as well. But you have to wonder, my, from the mindset of the ACLU, what are they trying to do here? Are they just trying to attract bad publicity for the church? Are they just trying to tie up the church's resources in a, in a battle, in a legal battle? They've already tried one of these lawsuits and it got dismissed. And the fact that they're trying again, I think that raises some questions. It does raise some questions, and it's probably all the above, right? They're trying to tie up their resources and their time and their focus, and I think they're trying to set a precedent. And, and you know, that's what this, you know, the abortion mentality is, is all about, especially from these, you know, very extreme groups. I would call them extreme, at least, because they're trying to, they're trying to push their agenda on other people. They don't care what you believe. They want you to, to take part in what they believe, you know, and, and so, which is ironic because a lot of times those groups uh, you know, accuse religious groups or whatever of trying to push their beliefs mm -hmm. on other people. So this is a case where, you know, there's a service being provided and, and uh, or there isn't a service being provided that they want you to provide. You know, and I just think it's, it's kind of, it's just ridiculous. It, it's just, it's just crazy. You wonder, you wonder what are their motives. Um, and so Eve Pigeon, she's the manager of public relations at Trinity Health Corporation. She had the following to say about it. This case has no merit. A federal court already dismissed a similar ACLU claim, and we will seek dismissal of the suit for the same reason. So just like you said, there's already been something like this in the past. It would seem to be likely that it would be dismissed based on the same grounds in, in, in the past, um, but I guess time will, will tell. Right, absolutely. One other point to mention, the Catholic Church does so much in healthcare in this country. This particular corporation has 25,000 licensed physicians. They're doing so much good. Mm -hmm. So often the Catholic hospitals are the ones that are serving the underprivileged, the uninsured. So why attack them? You can, it's really an ideological battle. They really are just pushing for abortion that you would try to attack a group that's doing so much 
to serve those who are in need and who aren't going to be able to be served anywhere else. Absolutely. And, you know, I think they get get away with it almost, not get away with it, but they hide behind this. The whole reason that they say they're suing them is because these Catholic hospitals are denying emergency health care. It always seems to be this like hiding behind words, right? Choice and things like that uh, to make it seem like it's something that it's not actually. And so this seems like one of those of, of those cases, right? And and they're just saying, well, you're denying this emergency healthcare that we could like they have to have this. It's this emergency thing that they have to have. But really, when you look into it, it's not true healthcare. It's not helping the woman. It's not helping the baby. And that's what the hospitals, mm -hmm. you know, they're saying is that listen, uh, we look for the well-being of both the baby and the mother. And in the case of abortion, there the well-being of the baby is completely disregarded. So we, you know, we're not gonna. That's not healthcare, right? And so, um, you know, they faithfully followed th these practices. It isn't just abortion. You know, it's palliative care, it's birth control, and and other things as well. And and these hospitals have faithfully adhere to those policies. So it's not like they're just, you know, all of a sudden cutting things off or something or trying to wiggle right. with just certain things. They adhere to, you know, what what the Catholic Church says is, right. is to be practiced or not practiced. Absolutely. So. Coming up after the break, we'll take a look at why some women are rejecting the pill. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to Heroic Media. In case you're just joining us, I'm Patrick Cordova. And I'm Michelle Bauman. In our next story, a new documentary on the pill is raising the question, is women's biology a disease that needs to be fixed? Yeah, what do you think, Patrick? It is, totally. We've got to fix that biology. The well, whole pregnancy thing is ridiculous. It's so funny because when you <laughs> say it like that, it's such an obviously ridiculous proposal, and yet that's yeah. what the pill is suggesting. It's yeah. suggesting, okay, women, the way that your body made is a problem, and you need yep. to take medication and hormones to change it and to fix it. But the way it's advertised, like we always talk about on the show, it seems like is the words, right? The, the, it's hidden behind the words. You're actually, no, this is healthcare, and you are actually taking control uh, you know, before you were out of control, and now you're taking control by taking the pill. Right. So it seems kind of like it's the the argument uh, for for pushers of the pill is reframed such that hey, no, this is something that's good for you, and you're participating in your you know women's rights, and you're taking control of your life. And if you don't do this, then you're not. So I think just the way the argument is framed and how people talk about it generically, uh, it, it seems like it's automatically subconsciously implanted in a lot of women's brains that, oh, if I don't do this, then I'm doing something wrong, right. like not the norm, like I'm not in control, I'm not doing something that I should be doing as a woman. Right, it's so widespread, and there's that same mentality, I think, with doctors. There's so many cases in which it's the default. I know women Absolutely. who have had different problems and gone in to see a doctor, yep. and the doctor's like, oh, here, here, take the pill, and they're like, well, what other options are there? And the doctor's like, oh, there are, you know, that's the only thing you can do. And it turns out that's not true, yep. but the doctors are actually trained to see that as the, you know, this magical multivitamin that will just solve all of your problems. Problems. You know, oh, you have acne, you have PMS, you have endometriosis, all these different things. Yep. I, I love this, this quote from Serena, the author of this article. Mm -hmm. The pill isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, and women are tired of being forced to treat it as such. I think that's really very, very, it's exactly the point that yes. this whole thing is making, is that we need to be willing as women, as a community, as the medical community, to look beyond that. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and just to echo your statements, I, I know several of, of women friends of mine who have said the same thing, like, you know, they have some sort of condition, medical condition specific to a woman, and they say, you know, their doctor prescribed them the pill. And so they get very, you know, up in arms about like, oh, you know, you know, the pill's okay, you know, I have to have it for this, you know, or I have to have it for that. And like you were saying, that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's kind of what this article and, and, and documentaries and similar things like this that are coming out, um, uh, kind of seek to expose. And really, it, it is about knowing your options. Knowing your options in that the pill isn't, doesn't have to be, and isn't necessarily the answer for, for all of these things. And in many cases, it seems to me like there's a lot of alternatives that, that, that could be taken. And as we've talked about on the show before, the, 
the pill, especially hormonal contraception, that uh, is is a class one carcinogen. Rated, mm -hmm. you know, by the World Health Organization has has said that. So it's something that does not help your health as a woman. And so there are other natural alternatives. We've we've talked about several of them on on this show: natural family planning, Napro technology, mm -hmm. and um, and yeah, I think it comes down to also. Um, uh, education as well. Absolutely. You know, I, I think the statistic is something like 40%. There's a, a recent survey or mm -hmm. study that showed that 40% of women don't even really understand their own natural fertility cycle. Right. That's shocking to me. Yeah. How is that empowering? <laughs> you know, like women are so empowered because they take the pill, they don't even understand what's going on with their bodies. Yeah. And I think that one thing that's so powerful about this story, this mm -hmm. documentary that's being made, it's not being made from a religious perspective. Yeah. And so, I, and we've talked about other, about other um, NFP apps that are out that are made by groups that are secular that are just saying hey we want this natural approach yes and so this is this is um, you know the this is a follow-up documentary from um, the 2007 documentary the business of being born and so that's Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein and they're saying in that one they said well women are trending more towards natural birth towards you know working with your body that mm -hmm. kind of thing and now in this follow-up they're saying well actually women are kind of thinking about the same thing when it comes to the pill they don't want artificial hormones in their milk they don't want artificial chemicals genetically modified foods so are women starting to rethink whether they actually want to put these chemicals directly into their bodies yeah absolutely and I think that that you hit the nail on the head right there's all this focus you know you always see these you know women they're very health centric right like you said you know they don't want pesticides in their food and they don't want you know they want to get uh, organic only and you know there's there's this huge push for health and they're exercising and they, they're focusing on health and, and, and a natural way of doing things. And so they're starting to question, well, you know, hey, I do all this other stuff that's like natural and I seem to promote all this, you know, healthy things and then I go take a pill every day, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, well, what's the real deal? I think they're starting to question and say, hey, sh is there a, another alternative? And the documentary that you mentioned with Ricky Lake, you know, I think those things start to help uncover uh, hey, there's other ways of doing things. Like you mentioned, the whole natural birth thing. There's been like so, like so many more people that I know that are trying to do like home births and things like that. And of course, that's a whole other discussion in of itself. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think natural is definitely kind of the theme of why women are starting to look in a different direction mm -hmm. because they want to uh, you know they 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 want to they don't want to fight their body or treat it like right. it's a disease like we mentioned exactly. at the very beginning. They want to find a way to, to accomplish what they're looking for, but in a way that doesn't you know, de destroy their body or treat it as something that it's not. Absolutely, yeah, and, and I think the, this quote from Ricky Lake kind of sums it up. What we did for birth, we're trying to do for birth control, and that's to empower the consumer with information. Not tell women what to do, but offering access to information and choice. That's the real empowerment, you know, yes. not you know, putting women, girls 13 years old on some hormones that they're gonna be taking right. blindly for several decades, yeah. but actually giving them the knowledge and the information about their bodies. And that's totally key, I think you're exactly right. Giving that information is the true empowerment, because then, that woman can make an informed, an informed decision on the, on the best choice for herself. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, and our next story, 23-year-old pop star Demi Lovato's decision to do a nude photo shoot in the name of women's empowerment has left some women scratching their heads. So yet another topic of empowerment More and women, empowerment. right? So I guess, you know, it goes along the theme of what society, uh, you know, secular society specifically says is empowering, mm -hmm. right? And so... I don't, there is yeah, a continual theme, right, that says, you know, if you are, if you, and, and, and Demi, she's, she's had, had issues with body image. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so this was her way, I guess, of saying, uh, I don't have an issue anymore. Yeah, let right. Me, let me pose nude <laughs> to right. prove it. Right. Right. And you know, yeah. I have to say, I'm grateful that she does speak out on these body issues, image. body image, and, mm -hmm. and she's a big advocate of mental health care, right. um, because I think that's something that a lot of women struggle with. And so, for her to say, you know, you can overcome this, I think that's really great. Great. Um, I think her quote in this case, she said, "You can feel comfortable and confident in your skin." And and her new album is called Confident. And so, mm -hmm. this was part of the promotion for that, just saying, "Hey, look, I'm so confident. I've overcome some of these body image issues, and you." can too. Mm -hmm. the, and, and I'm really glad that she's trying to address this. The thing is she's doing it wrong. Yeah. And the thing is, yes, your body is beautiful and mm -hmm. you don't need to worry about it, but it's beautiful and it's dignified because it's created in the image and likeness of God. Right. And when she misses that foundation, that she does something 
that undermines that dignity, which is to present her body as an object yeah. in a way that it's not intended to be, you know, shown to everyone. Right, exactly. And I, you, you said it better than I could say, but that, that's exactly right. And I think a lot of these, you, you mentioned, you know, that her knowledge or probable lack of knowledge of, of you know, men and women being created in the image and likeness of God, I think that that is, you know, knowledge of where we come from and our belief in God ha has a huge amount to do with all the problems that we talk about on this show. And this is no exception to that, right? And to me, it almost seems like when, when women do that, to me, it doesn't seem like they're empowered or strong or, or anything like that. It seems to me almost that there's a desperation, to be honest with you, because it seems like they're swinging so far to one side instead of them showing their confidence by uh, the way they interact with others or, or in any number of other different ways that don't involve nudity, they go all the way to the opposite mm -hmm. extreme. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like one of, you know, like, oh, I'm afraid of heights, so I'm gonna go up on an airplane and jump out and do a, you know, in, in parachute or something, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's like the ultimate form of ex extremism for right. the scenario that you're in. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, it, that's just my initial thought on the situation when people do that sort of thing. Right, yeah, and the idea was that she wanted this to be no Photoshop, no, you know, special oh, makeup, yeah. no special lighting, Very just, natural. you know, this is natural. Yeah. And I think that's admirable, but you you don't have to take your clothes off to do that because <laughs> Photoshop is so widespread that you know people's faces are completely Photoshopped, their yeah. clothes, their body, you know, image. So she could have done that without and said, you know, okay, women, you don't have to be a slave to this Photoshop image without taking off her clothes. And this this quote from this author, Monica Weigel, isn't it possible that there is a better way to show a hard-earned confidence? than by continuing to imply that women's bodies are public property. Yeah. I thought that kind of nailed it on the head because Absolutely. that's what she's doing. She's saying like, you know, here's my body, it's an object for everyone rather than giving right. it the dignity and the respect that it deserves. Yeah, because I think I'm beautiful, which she is. Why would, you know, you must share that with everybody, mm -hmm. right? You're selfish if you don't or something. That's kind of like the sense that I get. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, I hope that things don't backfire on her as well, right? Because she obviously had this body image thing and now she's doing this photo shoot and she's going all in, like I just said, chips are all in and she's not doing even Photoshop, which is mm -hmm. rampant. And so now, you know, hopefully, you know, you know how people are relentless on people the internet be, yeah, and absolutely. And it's just like, you know, if, if, the, if things aren't Photoshop and they're talking about a picture and she sees all these things and they're talking negatively, I hope that it doesn't backfire Absolutely, well. that's a good so, point. Yeah, lots of, th lots of think about. <laughs> All right, stay tuned. We have one more story coming up after the break. Hello and welcome back to Heroic Media. In our final story, a billboard linking dating apps to an increase in STD rates has caused one app, Tinder, to issue a cease and desist order against the group behind the billboards. So this is an interesting story. Uh, so I guess this, <clears throat> this billboard um, had a picture, I guess a silhouette of like four, you know, some men and women. Um, and then uh, it had, in, in quote, to quote it, uh, Tinder, chlamydia, grinder, gonorrhea. So basically, Tinder and Grindr are a couple of, of these apps. So the way these apps work, I guess we should explain a little bit, mm -hmm. right? So the way these apps work is you have like your picture and some information about you, like your age and stuff, and uh, you, you look for other people that are in your area that you would like to date, that might, might meet your qualifications. And the way that it works is kind of super quick. You open the app up and then uh, you see somebody's picture, and if you like them, then you you know you swipe right and if you don't like them you swipe left and basically you decide instantly like hey would i like to meet this person or not and then you can choose to meet up with this person and see how close they are to you because it uses your gps and, and things like that so it's kind of a modern way of meeting people it's an app that has some very basic information a picture the information right away so you can go do i want to date this person or not and then date them right yeah. And in reality, it's actually often used to hook up because Most it tells you who's near you at any given time. It's yes. based on location. And so the reality is some people are using it for to find a relationship. A lot of people are using it just for casual sexual encounters. Um, we don't know how many people exactly are on it, but Tinder claims 8 billion, 8 billion people are using years, yeah. their app. So that's a, a lot. huge, huge, huge <laughs> amount. And so the, this, this group, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, put out this billboard in L.A. Um, and it was saying, hey, this is causing 
higher rates of STDs, and it was basically encouraging STD testing. Yep, exactly. Basically, yes. And so, uh, you know, I can see, I'm glad that they posted the billboard because, you know, it kind of gives people, I mean, maybe a heads up, like, hey, you know, but I think people already know, like, that are using it. Hey, this is like for hookups. You know, well, I would, I would think. You at would least. think, and then, but then the crazy thing is that Tinder is denying this, and they're the ones that that issued the cease and desist, and they said you can't prove that our app has anything to do with these increased STD rates, as if, you know, the the e even if you can't prove that, it's just logical. If more casual right. sexual encounters people are having on a mass level, the more that there's going to be a rise in STDs. Yeah, and there have been some some cases. I think it was in Rhode Island and then also in Colorado where the health departments there had seen an increase right. correlated to app use, usage, right? Dating app usage. So uh, they had, and a lot of them were men that were coming in also. Uh, but I think it was something like roughly half of the people that came in um, to uh, you know, say, hey, I've got this, you know, I need to get checked out, and then sure enough, they had an, an STD. Um, they also had uh, said that they used the dating app. Right. So it seems like there is some, with, with an explosion of, of how many STDs there have been reported, I think the Colorado case, I'm just going off memory here, it was like in a period from January to July of 2014, comparing that to 2015, there was a, um, I, I can't remember what the percentage 56 was. 56 percent increase. Thank you, 56 percent increase. That's a big increase That's in one year. That's a huge increase, yeah. Absolutely. And, and a lot of those people were using, reported that they used the right. app. Right, almost half of them. That's right. that that's alarming to have it increase so much in such a small amount of time. An another statistic in Rhode Island, as you mentioned, a study earlier this year, the Department of Health found that rates of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia were all at a 10-year high in the state. And the Rhode Island Health Department said, we do not know how much social media has contributed to the rise in STDs, but we believe it is a contributing factor. So I think it's kind of hard to make the argument that no, this has nothing to do with it. It's just randomly spiking. Um, New York, Utah, and Texas also are increased, are reporting similar increases. So it's, it's being reported pretty widespread here. Yeah, absolutely. It seems to be that there's a correlation, but uh, you know, obviously people be careful out there, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're following the teachings of the church, you don't have to worry about that. Absolutely. Even better point. All right, that's it for this week on Heroic Media. Please join us next week for all the up-to-date news on the pro-life issues that matter to you. Please feel free to write to us with any comments, questions, or news tips at news at heroicmedia.org. And please visit our website at heroicmedianews.org where you can check out more stories like the ones we discussed on this episode. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep us in your prayers. God bless. Thank you.